Good day, Africa, and welcome to another exciting edition of AU Talks. And AU Talks is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. And wherever you've joined us on the continent, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we are privileged to have you online. Don't forget that you can join this conversation via uh, social media platforms, and it is Association of African Universities um, Television. And um, today we are excited to have a uh, talk once again to discuss another very, very relevant um, topic um, around the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and what universities have adopted or adapted within the past year. And so last year when universities were hit with COVID-19, um, as we already know, we had to go into lockdowns. We, we had to adopt or adapt online teaching, some blended and some hybrid. And one year down the line, we want to find out what the experience has been with some of our institutions. Have um, our academics been able to adapt completely to the online session? Um, what are the struggles? Have um, our students also been able to adopt or adapt or adjust to the online um, pedagogy um, so beautifully? And so to do the discussion with us, we are privileged to have Dr. Barringham Idrusu, and he's a senior tutor at the Bagabaga College of Education. And he was with us um, two weeks ago and we discussed um, issues of research and today we want to go into pedagogy. So if you can hear me, Dr. Um, Idrisu, you are welcome to AU Talks. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwisistam, for um, engaging me today. I'm privileged and I want to thank you very much for having time for me so that we can engage on this very important topic. Great. We are also excited to have you, and it's always an honor to host you, uh, to share your knowledge and your experience with the entire continent. But to set our, um, our discussion straight, I know you very well, and I believe that those who have watched your videos um, will also know you. But today, tell us what we don't know about you. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a very interesting one. Um, what you don't know maybe much about me is, um, Maybe probably let me see my marriage life. Uh, I am okay. not single. I'm, I'm married with uh, six children. Oh, That's four boys, two girls. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, excellent. Um, you are you are you are a great man. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> All right, great. So let's let's move straight into the discussion. One of the very important things that happened to. African higher education in combating COVID-19 um, was to move from face-to-face -face pedagogy to um, online pedagogy uh, or blended um, pedagogy. And we want to find out from you, how has the journey been for Bagabaga College of Education? It's been a year. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, blended learning, let me give you a, a, a brief background. It's a teaching and learning strategy that adopts both traditional face-to-face -face methods of teaching in addition to virtual learning. So we combine, when you combine the two of them together, we call it blended learning approach. Uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit us hard, we adopted the blended learning approach in partnership with our mentoring university, which is the University of Education, Winneban. So we divide our students into two cohorts. Usually the first cohort will be on campus and they will be receiving face-to-face -face instruction, whilst the second cohort stay at home and receive instruction virtually. And we use a variety of platforms to be able to reach our students virtually. Some of those particular um, uh, uh, online learning platforms include Zoom meetings. Okay. We have the Google Google calls or Google meetings. Mm -hmm. We have the type calls. We also make good use of uh, WhatsApp uh, meetings. We adopt uh, the use of uh, sometimes direct email of uh, assignment and course material to our students, among other online uh, instructional strategies. So on a whole, uh, this has been how we have adopted a blended learning approach. So 
as we deliver the instruction in the, like I have mentioned earlier, at a particular point in time, those on campus will have to take their pieces and then they will go, they will swap their rules. So they will go, but they will go home and be receiving the remaining part of what the curriculum through the, uh, what do we call it, through the virtual or online learning mode. Whilst the other cohort, which was receiving the virtual learning, would now report on campus for direct face to face instructions. And then if there are any assignment or quizzes they have to face, then we give it to them during face to face. I must add that what we have not adopted has been the online learning assessment. There have been a controversy in Ghana, not only in Ghana, the whole of Africa. People are still skeptical about the online learning approaches. If you use online learning approach to graduate somebody, people are still skeptical about that. So right. So, no, why, why do you think um, academics are, are a bit skeptical? I remember one of the key issues we had to battle last year when mm -hmm. AU was developing content and engaging academics on the continent. I remember in Nigeria, where there was one critical issue raised by the uh, higher education regulatory body that mm -hmm. uh, most of the academic programs were accredited for face to face when they had to move to the virtual space and they were not accredited for online um, mm -hmm. um, space. So that was one of the critical issues that, that really happened. But what do you think um, is, is causing this skepticism among academics and even students on the continent with regards to online um, teaching and learning? I think, first of all, we can trace it to the, to the leadership, the perception of uh, that particular change on the part of the administrators of the institutions of high learning. Until recently, most of the online learning programs are also not acceptable. They are not accredited by National Accreditation Board in Ghana, but uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. So I can trace the blame or the issue to the perception of the online learning, uh, online learning, uh, 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 online learning strategies based on the fact that most of our institutions of high learning, the vice chancellor or those at the top there, they don't, they have that particular negative perception, maybe in terms of quality issues. And then the second issue is uh, people th still think that we should continue to run education or deliver education using the same traditional ways of doing things. But that can, cannot continue forever. If you look at the recent data from uh, World Bank, learning crisis is real in Africa. Recent data, 2018 data from World Bank indicated that there are over 37 million children who are in schools in Africa. And they will learn so little that by the time they complete school, they will not be significantly better than their counterparts who did not step foot into school. Mm -hmm. So it means that there is a big question in terms of the quality of education we are churning out to our students. And therefore, we need to change or we need to have a shift in the pedagogy by adopting the virtual learning platform where some of the best lecturers or the best teachers across the world can easily successfully deliver instruction to our students regardless of their geographical location. I don't know whether you are getting the point I'm making. Yes, so I am, but- We need, we need to change our mm -hmm. attitude towards the new can, that has come. You know, we cannot continue to be backward. We cannot continue to do things the way we were taught. We have to adopt the technology and then integrate it into our teaching and learning to improve the learning outcomes of our students in line with the sustainable development goal for which put emphasis on what quality education and lifelong, lifelong learning. learning. Yes, no, right, 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 right. So, but don't you think that um, some of us may be confusing the the two terms? especially mm -hmm. online education and then also online teaching or online pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Don't you think we are confusing the two? That is why people are still thinking that uh, perhaps um, we are transferring our perception around online education to online teaching and learning. This is just like one of the pedagogies in teaching, so it shouldn't cause any mayhem to us as academics and to us as academic institutions. A very good observation. Uh, online learning 
is different from the blended learning we are talking about. With the blended learning we are talking about, most of the programs will be taken by the student using the face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. And some aspect of the curriculum will also be delivered to the student using the virtual or online learning. However, there are also some programs which are solely on online programs. Mm -hmm. So anytime some of our educational actors or policy makers hear the online learning, their perception is always that they think the student has done that particular program solely online. But mm -hmm. that is significantly different from the pedagogy. We have adopted the virtual learning or the online learning pedagogy. And pedagogy. we are adding, we are adding it to the traditional methods of teaching so that at the end of the day, we can holistically develop the child, equip the learner or the student with all the needed skills to be able to function effectively as a global citizen who is globally competitive. Very so well, I think, I, I think that is what we need to put across for all our stakeholders yeah. to understand that there's a, a huge difference between online education and then um, yeah. online uh, pedagogy. I think that, that that would be very great, but let, let's move into yeah. Um, another dimension of our discussion, which is very important. But, I believe but, that. Good. Good. But before you continue, mm -hmm. yeah, efforts have been made, and I'm aware the uh, president of Ghana uh, has worked with uh, some universities, Commonwealth universities in the UK and other institutions there, for us to be able to come up with a policy that will guide and, and create a room for the traditional methods of instruction to coexist with their online learning so that we can holistically train the child to become more competent, more patriotic, who can contribute to national development. So that particular innovation is on the way coming. I don't know right. the level it has reached now, but it is on the way coming in Ghana. Right. It's exciting to know that. But let's let's look at the other side of the coin. I believe that um, we all know that COVID happened to us um, all of a sudden and we're not prepared for it. But yeah. I am of the view that people complained or had issues because of um, capacity um, to, to move or migrate online, especially on the part of academics. Um, what has been the, the journey so far with, with your institution and uh, by extension, what you know about African universities or colleges of education, what has been the preparation of our academics um, into migrating it or migrating into um, online teaching? What, what can you share with us? That's a critical uh, question, which is uh, very important. Um, before we can successfully implement online learning in our educational institution, there are a lot of issues we need to take into consideration. For example, one, what is the level of the school infrastructure? I'm talking about the digital infrastructure, such as the computers, the projectors, the television set, the internet connectivity, among other factors. Number two, what is the level of teacher's pedagogical knowledge mm. on how to be able to apply or incorporate technology to improve the quality of learning of their students? Number three, we have to also consider the level of the school manager's support or their perception all things being equal. If the school head has a positive perception towards the online learning, then the person will be able to support the teacher, create a conducive atmosphere in the school for them to be able to implement and incorporate the innovation to improve students' learning. And the reverse is what true. Then we also have to look at even when those all these variables are there, what is the level of motivation on the part of the teachers? According to the research we did some few years back at the secondary schools in Northern Ghana, we realized that number one, most of the teachers, although they possess significant content knowledge, for example, in social studies in education or social studies as a subject, majority of them did not have the technical skill and know-how. So even if we supply the internet in the school and the teachers don't have that needed pedagogy or that needed technical know-how, on how to apply the technology to support student learning, then we are not going to register any positive uh, results. So there are a lot of factors we need to take into consideration. The infrastructure of the schools, the level of the teachers' uh, uh, access to technology, 
the level of their access to quality training that will build their capacity to be able to apply the technology. And then the level of even the students also access to technology. Until recently, I'm aware most senior high schools in Ghana, students are not allowed to use uh, smartphones on campus. So mm -hmm. if you are implementing online learning, and then on another left hand, or on the other hand, there is a policy that bars students from using smartphones on campus. So you can see that there is a, some kind of contradiction. Yes, too. sure. On so we'll, we'll get into policy issues. I believe that there are a lot of things that we need to, to change, but let me, I want to still further explore um, the experience of your university. So yeah. what were the preparations, sorry, your college of education, what were the preparations? Did your university organize capacity development programs um, for the academics? And did you leave the students out, if, if I should add? Because yeah. um, learning online is also not as easy as teaching online as well. That's fine, it, it's, it, it's good. Now, the trainings were delivered successfully to the teachers but like you have mentioned, students were not part of this particular training. And effective teaching or passing exams is not the same as learning. Absolutely. There have been many instances, many students are able to pass exams, but they don't possess the needed competencies and skills Very well. needed, at, needed at the job market. So any policy we are bringing, any new innovation we are bringing, we need to capture all the actors in the education industry. We need to capture all the stakeholders, including what students. So those trainings were delivered across the country. I'm aware of that. Government of Ghana supported those particular training, not only in the colleges of education, but even most of the universities took uh, the initiative to be able to organize those particular training to build the capacity of the faculty so that they could proceed to deliver this virtual learning to the students. However, I'm yet to hear one of the institutions, like I mentioned, that involved the students. Because at that time, students were even at home because of the lockdowns. Yes. So as a result, they were not part of uh, those particular uh, capacity building programs. Maybe another factor could also be maybe lack of resources or logistics to be able to bring the students on board. No wonder at the point in time, most of the students were not able to participate effectively in those particular online learning due to a number of factors. Some did not have access to what technology like computers, smartphones, some did not have. Others too, by virtue of their location, they could not, they didn't have access to the internet to be able to log in to, uh, uh, to, to benefit from those particular uh, virtual lessons. So moving into the future, we need to also think of the support we can give to the students. Is it possible for us to ask them to bring their smartphones to schools or to bring their own laptops to schools? Is it possible we can subsidize the laptops to most of the students from senior high schools to the university, highly subsidized laptops, so that it can support them on campus to be able to successfully apply the virtual or those particular resources to benefit from the visual learning that we are putting in place? But to sum up, my institution actually benefited from those particular training. Uh, one particular, some few universities in Europe and America started with um, a certificate program. I think it was about a month, almost a month or two program on how to uh, apply virtual learning to be able to support uh, the students' uh, learner outcome. And then almost all the colleges of education teachers were asked to enroll on the program. And then uh, people got enrolled. And then after that, the cost of the training and the cost of the certification was borne by TTEL, TTEL Ghana. I think they took up uh, that particular, uh, uh, that, that particular uh, uh, cost and supported them after the training. People were able to successfully uh, take their certificate from that particular institution. Apart from that, internally, my college also developed the capacity or built the capacity of the faculty. We also organized some internal training to be able to prepare teachers how to not only mastering the content within your subject area, but how to now know how to use the technology, online learning instructional strategies to be able to incorporate the tool so that at a point in time when you are handling the students, the first cohort or one of the cohort that need or require that you apply the virtual learning, you will do so. And the other one that demand that you be in the class face to face 
we are able to have been able to do so. So as I'm speaking now, our first cohort successfully completed their assignment and they went. I was taking some second year program, introduction to social studies. And the second the other cohort, which was out there, final year student, I'm taking them a particular course, global studies in Africa. So that one has successfully delivered some number of course and course material virtually to the student. But this week they have reported and the other cohort has gone back to And we are going right. to, to continue. Great. So, Doc, share, share with us what were the setbacks in the process? Um, like we already um, indicated, mm -hmm. some academics were not used to this space. And so, obviously, there were some resistance, there were some setbacks. Could you share with us um, what are some of the initial setbacks? And looking at the whole journey of close to one year, what are some of the, the new things you could share with us? The aha moment for some of the lecturers. Are they enjoying the online space or they still wish that? Um, we go back to the face-to-face the -face alone as a teaching uh, method. I think the, the online learning, observing and then interacting with my colleagues, it has come to stay. Through online learning, we have been able to successfully deliver effective teaching and learning to our students, regardless of their location, using technology. Again, with the application of the online learning, we are able to help our students to acquire the critical thinking skill, the communication, collaboration, and other important skills needed for them to effectively function in this 21st century. Again, I think the online learning is able to make, it, 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 it makes our lesson delivery very convenient. In your own hall, you can just log in, for example, Zoom, to be able to deliver teaching or your lesson to your students. So for me, the online learning is a good thing. The positives are many. However, there are other issues we need to also have a, a critical reflection on. One, the cost. Who bear the cost of the online learning? The labor laws of Ghana require that if you, if you expect an employee to deliver effectively based on his or her mandate, you need to equip the person with all the needed tools, the needed resources to create a conducive atmosphere for the person to be able to deliver. However, we have been asked to deliver online learning. Who bear the cost of data? And I'm aware most of the faculty members don't stay on campus. Even those on campus, what is the level of internet connectivity and what is the level of what? Reliability of the internet on campus. So for me, we can improve on that. Government of Ghana uh, and then the Colleges of Education Council should support the faculty members by giving them some tokens, at least monthly, to support them to be able to acquire data. Number two, teachers and students should be supported with laptops. Even at our level, we have some faculty members, and most of the time, some of the students, they don't have access to our laptops. So if we can get access to highly subsidized laptops, it will play a significant role in supporting us to be able to effectively deliver virtual learning to our students. Again, we need to also improve on the connection, internet connectivity on campuses. As we are speaking, I'm aware government of Ghana started a project aimed at equipping the colleges of education and some of the tertiary institutions, especially the public ones in Ghana. I don't know the level they have reached now, but we can do better. But as I'm speaking, sometimes there is always a, a gap between theory and practice. On paper, you hear that this number of secondary schools have been connected to internet. You go there to collect data and you check the whole campus and there's no internet connectivity. Mm -hmm. So as researchers, we shall always continue to open our eyes and we shall continue to bring out the issues and the gaps to help the policymakers so that we can design intervention and then innovation to be able to uh, help improve the system. But for now, I think we can work better. We can improve or do the online learning is good. And there are successes. There are so many successes come. At a point in time, we have to go to the student and then pick an anecdotal evidence. Evidence, OK. So I have to be able to find out how they are feeling especially when they are learning 
through virtual platform and when they come to campus, what is uh, uh, their feeling or how are they uh, finding the two together? And at a point in time, we need to even conduct one, a Pfizer experimental research to mm -hmm. compare the performance of students taught using the virtual mode and those taught using the traditional face-to-face -face instruction so that we can compare and make a correlation to see which one is superior. But from the literature, I think both are almost what the same. So for me, I will continue to advocate that. Let us continue to support. Let us channel more resources. Let us support the schools. Let us support the teachers. Let us support the students. Let us improve the infrastructure of the schools. And then come out with a very important and useful policy, policy guideline to support our teachers to successfully deliver online or blended learning. All right, so if you just tuned in, you are still watching AU Talks. AU Talks is brought to you by the Association of African Universities and would like to uh, call upon you to put in your questions. If you have any question, any contribution, you, you can just uh, put that in a message um, box and uh, we'll read that on the show for you as well. Doc, we'll go for a short break and um, when we return, we'll look at yeah. issues concerning academic um, dishonesty and um, issues of ex online examination. That is another area that we didn't do too well, um, with, but I think we need to explore that as well. All right, so Thank if you have any question, um, any comments you would want to make on the show, we will just ask that you put in in the chat box and then we will just read that um, for you. So welcome back from the break. Um, okay. um, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and thought um, with us. Critically, one of the areas that we couldn't um, explore as, as mm -hmm. AAU um, has to do with online examination as part of the teaching learning pedagogy. Um, mm -hmm. Could you share with us how were you able to check issues of academic dishonesty? I was mm -hmm. part of the process where I uh, monitored students who were right, submitting online examination assignments and mm -hmm. trust me the kind of things that happen I don't want to share with you <laughs> on this show <laughs> but um, <laughs> as, 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 as an academic how were you able to check that this assignment submitted by Kwesi is really mm -hmm. Kwesi's intellectual capacity I saw instances where students were changing index numbers and and what have you what what was your experience in your college uh to be honest I must be frank, uh, during the time that we we're assessing our students using the online uh, 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 medium, uh, I wasn't directly involved. By then I was still preparing to defend my thesis, my final thesis. So I was given that particular time to concentrate on my program. Uh, let me also add that my program was a three year program at Kenyatta University. Only that when I came to Ghana, incidentally, COVID-19 hit, and I couldn't travel back to Kenya due to the COVID-19 restriction. Otherwise, for the past two and a half years, I was in Kenyatta University. So but coming back to your question, uh, I also heard of the controversies. Uh, effective teaching and, teaching and learning cannot be separated from assessment. Absolutely. And the best and the best form of assessment we are adopting or advocating now is competence-based assessment. Based assessment. Mm -hmm. That is the new paradigm we are expecting all the educational actors to adopt. Kenya, at the moment, they are implementing that. They are implementing their CBC curriculum, and they are also implementing the competence-based assessment. Coming back to Ghana, you cannot actually uh, assess the learning outcomes of, of students using the online platform, especially at the level we are now as a country, not only in Ghana, even most African countries, because we don't have the infrastructure. Now, if we are, it is very easy for you to check, especially at advanced level, for example, postgraduate students, when they submit their thesis, their 10 papers, we have different software we can use to check the plagiarism and whatever. For mm -hmm. example, we have Ten Ten it in. Ten it in you can yeah. use it and other so many software to check the academic uh, dishonesty or whatever, the originality of the students uh, work. However, when it comes to assessing the student learning outcomes, we don't have that infrastructure in place yet. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you give students 
assignment for them to do. And all of them are supposed to do the assignment concurrently. And you don't have the know-how. Elsewhere, they have secret camera mounted across all the students. So mm -hmm. as you log in to take the exam, the secret, the, 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 the secret camera is snapping you. And the person at the university can see that you, Mr. Uh, let's say Eric Bachi or Mr. Kusi Sam is the one taking the piece or the exam. Mm -hmm. But what, what, we, what was happening here, I was told it was not the case. Most of the university or the institutions didn't have the capacity to monitor that. Number two, so now, like you mentioned, you will not know whether these particular items have been answered by this particular individual or not, you wouldn't know. Therefore, I am happy that some universities, although they adopted the online learner at the point in time, but in terms of the online assessment, they say, hey, Jack, let us pause a bit and study the system a bit. But other universities were able to navigate their way through, including my own institution. But mm -hmm. there's always room for improvement. The way it was done, we did not have the capacity to determine whether those particular items being answered are actually from that particular student. We, don't, we did not have that capacity. And therefore, anybody could just log in or the student can just get anybody who is more superior in the knowledge within the discipline. And the person, the person can just sit by the student and support the student to answer the question. You wouldn't know. Mm. So in future, I think if we are to incorporate online learning and then online assessment into our teaching and learning, we need to build the capacity and then acquire infrastructure and the superior software to be able to support us so that we can not only implement the online teaching and learning, but we should be able to adopt the online assessment as well. There are so many international exams if you are writing. Now they have the capacity to know whether you are the person writing or not. Mm -hmm. For example, some of them, you even need your finger, they need your finger mm -hmm. for, you, exactly, for you to be able to log in. So without your fingerprint, no any other person can log in. But we didn't have all this. So I think we can improve on that. Gradually, gradually, African countries, we shall get there. Great. Uh, okay. So, Doc, you, you have mentioned a lot of interventions that must be done in our institutions um, to get there. But let me ask you, are we too far from getting there? Um, and then let me add another question, which has to do with quality assurances. What are the quality processes that we need to take into consideration um, using the blended learning uh, methodology. If, if you can just combine these two, that would be great. Okay. So comparing our level of application of technology in teaching and learning to that of the advanced countries in the West and Europe, I think we need to up our game. We need, there is more room for improvement. We are far, far behind compared to other countries in Europe and that of America. So I think we can do better. We can do better on that. In terms of quality assurance issues, um, after training, quality education, let me start with uh, by explaining quality education. Quality education will usually require three ingredients. We have the input, we have the process, and we have what the output. If our input are correct and the process are also correct, then the output, which is student passing their exam, taking their certificate, and then acquiring the needed knowledge, skills, and competency will automatically come. But if your input are wrong, or if you don't get the input correct, or the input are correct, but the processes are wrong then you see that the output is going to be very problematic. So we have to start addressing the issues of input. For example, the caliber of teachers teaching from the secondary to the university level. Do they have the needed training? Do they have the expertise in the area they are teaching? Are they well equipped and well versed in those particular areas? Not only content, but in terms of pedagogy, do they have the needed training and skills to be able to deliver the same content using online platforms? These are the critical areas or critical issues we need to address. 
do we have infrastructure in our schools enough to create conducive environment for effective teaching and learning? We need to improve on that. Our lecture halls, do we have spacious lecture halls, laboratories, ICT centers to be able to allow the teachers enough space and create conducive environment in our schools and universities? If yes, then that is fine. When we come to the process, process we are talking about the time management. We are talking about the leadership. We are talking about the extent to which the teachers are delivering based on their expectations. We are talking about the level at which effective supervision is being ruled out in the institution to see whether the actors are actually working based on the standard or based on the guideline. Now, if all these issues are in place, then we expect that at the end of the day, the outcome, which will be the student graduating from those popular institutions, acquiring the needed knowledge, skills, competencies, in addition to their certificate, which they will be obtaining, will now be all effective. And therefore, in terms of quality assurance, we wouldn't have an issue. But where there are problems with the input or there are problems with the output, then in terms of the final results, your guess can be good as well. Mine. <laughs> so it's more or less like the garbage in, garbage out principle. Exactly. And then to quote Professor Aluki, who attended one of the international conference made up of educational actors in Africa, mm. he said, at this point in time, Africa cannot fail to act. To, I'm paraphrasing him, Africa cannot fail to act. To act. And that initially, during the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have the capacity to know what was happening in Europe. But at, the, at this point in time, globalization and di digitalization are now part of the global phenomenon. And as Africans, we cannot afford to pretend not to see the role of technology in national and continental development. And therefore, we need to adopt it and then leverage the benefit and the potential that technology comes with in all aspects of our lives, including education, so that it will help train the human resources we are expecting to have, who will support Africa develop to reach our African Union 2063 agenda by 2030. Very well. So I, I think that over the space of one year, um, pe perception or people's perception concerning online or blended teaching and learning has improved even though we've not gotten there yet as a continent. The issues um, are that we need to improve uh, school infrastructure, um, develop capacity of academics and students to be able to adjust very well. And um, looking into the future, and I am so much excited that your institution is responsible for training um, teachers for the country. And so looking into the future, what are the strategies of Kabagaba um, College of Education or Colleges of Education in Ghana in general to make sure that as the teacher goes through the three-year period um, of instruction in school, mm -hmm. when he goes out as a full professional, he or she is equipped with the knowledge and skill to be able to continue this agenda of um, online teaching or blended learning because we do not know the next pandemic um, that may, may come, God forbid, but um, mm -hmm. as we all know, this has come to stay. What is the strategy of your college in training your students to make sure that they're able to respond to the current drive um, that we, we already have? Okay, good question. Um, at in my college, we have a long-term vision mm. of preparing the teachers holistically, uh, not only in the course area or the content alone, but our dream or our vision is to produce that teacher who can who, who become very competent well equipped with knowledge and skills within the content area of the various subject the person has been trained the person will be trained to acquire knowledge and skills on the characteristics of learners and ways of creating conducive environment to support effective teaching and learning we are thinking of creating a teacher who will become well-versed in his or ability to effectively assess 
teaching and learning using what competency based assessment strategies. We are thinking of training a teacher who will acquire the needed knowledge and competences such as critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration and creativity, teamwork, the person who will acquire digital literacy. So that when the person complete the program and go out, the person will have the capacity to deliver not only face-to-face -face quality teaching and learning, but the person will also be able to deliver effective online learning to the students at the basic level of education. Because at the moment, we are talking of the blended learning at the uh, universities now yes. and colleges of education. We have not yet started at the secondary level. We have also not yet started serious work at that of what? At that of the basic level. Basic level. Mm -hmm. I must add that ICT is a subject they teach, but uh, we are not actually putting in place measures to actually push the teachers to start using their online learning. Over there, it is what? Just direct face to face instruction they are delivering. So that our vision is that we are training the teachers so that when they go out there, who knows, like you said, in future, who knows they should be able, they should be, have that particular knowledge and skill to be able to deliver not only face-to-face -face instruction, but that of what? The virtual learning to the students in the basic schools we will be serving in Ghana. And therefore, that is the big vision we are having as an institution. Great. I, I think your colleague um, is doing a lot of things right. We have to pay you a visit um, to really okay. learn from you and share um, across the continent the good things that you are doing. But just um, a final question, uh, and then we'll go to our participant if they have any comments or questions to ask. Mm -hmm. In line with the SDG goal four, you will, um, will you, let me put it that way, will you say that blended learning or online education will create access uh, to, to higher education on a continent? Um, would, you, would you say that? Yeah, definitely. Online learning has expanded access to quality education. Um, if you implement online learning effectively, and then within the broad spectrum, it should be possible for students, especially in most of the universities in Ghana or in Africa, to receive lessons from other universities in Europe and America, China, et cetera, et cetera. After all, by use of, for example, Zoom meetings, you should be able to sit in Tamale or Bolga or Accra or Wali Wali and then connect to a classroom or one of the universities in the United States of America or you know, one of uh, the best universities in the United Kingdom. So for me, online learning has the uh, potential of creating and expanding access to what? Quality education for all and lifelong learning opportunities. If we manage it effectively, we have the propensity or the capacity to achieve the sustainable development goal for, which puts emphasis on what? Quality education and lifelong learning opportunity for all by 2030. So for me, yes, it is true. It has expanded access to what? Quality education for all. However, there are, I know that there are challenges. If we put our heads together, to dialogue, to discuss, and to come up with innovation and other interventions, I think we can address the issues, eliminate the bottlenecks and the barriers, and then be better prepare our schools, prepare our universities, prepare our students to be able to receive quality education better than we used to do. So for me, online learning is the best way to go. But at the start, let us not rush into only online learning, but it must be what? Blended, blended. Where, mm -hmm. where, where we still have what? The traditional face to face instruction being integrated together with that of what? That of the online learning. So, like right. I mentioned, where you can have one cohort, traditional face to face, the other cohort, virtual learning, and at the point you swap them, especially when it comes to assessment, you swap them so that they can come to campus. And then after interacting with the teachers or faculty members, they do the face to face assessment and go. Until the time that we have the capacity to what also deliver the online learning assessment. Mm -hmm. For me, we should have the blended learning. The blended learning is the way to go at the moment. All right.
that, that's amazing. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and knowledge with us. I think one, um, open the platform for our, our guests who are joined um, us today. If you have any question, if you want to ask any question, kindly put your hand up and we'll give you the opportunity um, to do so. Any, any question from our guests, any question from our, our people who have joined us? I think we'll give just five minutes for that. Yeah. Any guest contribution? All right, so we have uh, Dr. Stanley. Dr. Stanley, could you share with us just a minute what you think about the subject and the discussion? Dr. Stanley, good, yes. good. Um, I think we're still in the morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. You know, uh, just as uh, with technology, I have to be multitasking while uh, listening in. Absolutely. I had the opportunity to pursue my PhD using the Open University of Malaysia, uh, let me say, environment. While in Ghana, um, I was on the o, uh, OUM education PhD program. Um, all that my colleague had said is true and true. Uh, we are not there yet. And the students we are actually handling tend to be uh, more knowledgeable using new media than uh, those of us who are standing in front of them or in front of our laptops teaching. So as my colleague said, uh, we need a lot more education. And I would want to ask him, um, how do we get the faculties to actually accept the technology? Um, I, I am a lecturer at GIG and um, the Dean of the Weekend School. Great. And um, GIG had gone fully online yeah. because we experienced some COVID uh, uh, scare. So my office actually monitors what happens using Google Form. And uh, what I have picked up is most of the faculty um, are not as good when it comes to using, not even using, accepting the technology first and willing to use it. Yes, we've done training upon training and um, we have been able to overcome that, especially. Uh, as you said, the COVID had forced all of us um, to actually go in and use online. My question is, how can we uh, get faculty to first appreciate the use of instructional technology, accept it, because we doubt that um, I, th I think that's difficult. one of the huge stumbling block. And on the other side, um, for the students, we assume that they, they know how to use technology. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot more there who have never used smartphone before. Absolutely. So these are difficulties. So how do we resolve these things so that we can have that smooth um, teaching and learning? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanley, for that contribution and question. Um, before Dr. Barringham um, gives feedback, one will pick um, that of, oh, my guest um, just went out. We wanted to pick the thought of uh, Mr. A.K. Bensa on what he also thinks about this. But before he, he reconnects, maybe Doc, you could just provide some feedback to Dr. Stanley's um, assertion. Thank you very much, Modrita. That's uh, Mr. Kusi Sam. And thank you, Doc Enning, for the question. Um, 
your question is um, requiring how we can, as Africans, get the buy-in of the faculty members to be able to apply the online learning in their universities or their institutions. Now, so many issues come into play. For example, if you call faculty members for training, capacity building, and most of them don't have enough laptops which are functioning effectively, no matter how you struggle to deliver quality training to them, at the end of the day, they will not be able to apply what you have trained them to do because they don't have the needed tools. Also, apart from the training, I think we need to add in some little motivation. And this will go to the vice chancellors and other managers of their universities in Africa. Mm. To be able to get the buy-in of our teachers and faculty members, we need to add some little motivation to the teachers. For example, we can come up with an internal policy or a guideline that within a semester, maybe some small token will be given to the best 10 faculty members who have been successfully applied the online learning. And this information is very easy to be mined. You can mine the data from the students because the students are best evaluators of their lectures. No other method can be used to fairly assess a lecturer than his or her student. So therefore, we can add or try that particular strategy. Too. And then the last one, we can also intensify the monitoring. After training, after motivation, and after equipping the lecturers with the needed digital infrastructure and tools, we need to also add in a little supervision. Not even little, but we need to intensify supervision. If you are supposed to have virtual classes within a particular period of time, at least people within the department, for example, heads of departments will have the capacity to monitor, to see online whether you are actually delivering based on the time schedule indicated by the school work timetable. I think when we adopt this particular small, small intervention, we can improve the rate of adoption and utilization of the virtual learning together with the traditional face-to-face -face instructional pedagogy we have been using in our schools. Great. And I, I think that we need um, more or less like a national dialogue where we have the government, academic institutions, industry players, the CSOs, the NGOs, everyone who is an education stakeholder um, on board to have a very exhaustive discussion or discourse around this because I believe that it goes even beyond the, the teacher's acceptance. You rightly mentioned motivation. And so we need the vice chancellor's Ghana. We need all these um, education regulators to be on the same platform to, to really have a, an exhaustive discussion. I think that that would be much more helpful to have a national or a holistic picture of, of the yeah. issue at the country level. And I think that these are very important in people adopting or accepting the fact that we are in a new normal and. Um, this is the best pedagogy to help us. One of the things that is is, uh, is very important is um, during the face-to-face, -face, it was a bit difficult to handle 500 students in a class. When you go to universities yeah. in Ghana, lecture theaters couldn't handle 500 students per session. You, you have some of them standing around and what have you. But I think with a Zoom, you have a capacity yeah. up to a thousand and there are a lot of merits in, in this approach, but I think we need a yeah. national dialogue for all of us to be on the same page. All right, so I think that Doc um, would have to bring the discussion to, to a close, but before we do so, we want to take your final words. And I must sincerely thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience and what has happened in uh, Bagabaga College of Education. And we must pay your visit. Sorry, I think I was saying something, but- Okay, Pauline, please go ahead. I think I was saying something, but you did not hear me. Yes, please, okay. My mic was muted, so I was talking, but you didn't hear me. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. And Great. thank you for the opportunity. I just came out from court and I realized that there was a meeting going on. So I sat down to listen a bit. Mm. I'm very late, but I want to say that um, online education is 
very good. It's something that should stay, but on a very low tone till the COVID, the extent to which the online. Oh, we seem to be. Hello, Pauline. Are you still speaking? It helps me a lot because wherever I find myself, I hold my lecture. Yes. And the students are also there in any part of the world, whether they are in Nigeria. We have some students who are in Nigeria. So whether they are in Nigeria or they are in Ghana, and they could be in their offices, but they just log in. And it helps a lot. But one thing I would um, want to say is that it comes also. If, if I can be heard, I, I wanted to conclude that um, the network is a challenge. So in as much as networking is not consistent and constant, the flow can impede the online education. So Absolutely. if we can up our game with network, by giving the students the kind of Wi-Fi that will be strong enough to be able to capture this, the, the, um... <laughs> Again. Yeah, that, okay. that is the... That so is the quickly, let, let, let me... Quickly, let me make this as a, a intervention. So in um, last year, that's 2020, when we were going through this, uh, we realized a network challenge. Um, especially both from the student side and the lecturer side. So we use the OBS, uh, that's open broadcast software. So we got lecturers to learn how to use it, uh, hands-on learning. And then uh, what we agreed with them, instead of sitting in the class for the whole two hours, is it possible you can do a one hour lecture where you video, you use the OBS software to actually film or record yourself and then edit it or break it down into 20, 20, 20 minutes. Probably GIJ is lucky because we are Ghana Institute of Journalism and when it comes to new media, uh, we train our students to film news programs, and then we also train them to edit videos and voices. So probably that was an edge for us. So this is one of the contribution that I believe that when we take on, you shouldn't necessarily sit in front of the students for the two, three, four hours. You could just stay out, record it, break it into 20 minutes, you know, topic by or subtopic by subtopic, mm -hmm. and then share it with them on the WhatsApp platform. Yeah. They listen to it. And then when you meet them, it's a discussion. Yeah, cool. Thank you for very, giving very, me very the good. opportunity to make that. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. So, Doc, your final submission, I believe that the advocacy must go on. And this is not a one-stop um, discussion throughout the year and the years to come. We still need to uh, be the drum until everybody gets to know the sound of the music we want. So, Doc, your final words. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwesi Sam, the moderator for this opportunity. Um, online learning has come to stay. Uh, Dr. Stanley and then Pauline and other participants made their opinions known concerning the issue. The thinking behind online learning is that children or students or learners learn differently. They have different interests, they have different characteristics, and they learn differently in different learning environments. As a result, we should be able to use this technology to be able to deliver teaching and learning to the students based on their own needs and interests and based on their own pace. Not all learners or students learn on the same way. So when you are using technology, you are able to deliver teaching and learning to the students or learners based on their own peculiar needs, their peculiar interests, their peculiar ability, and then based on their own learning environment. And therefore, let us uh, continue to dialogue. I'm very happy you raise a very important issue that is national dialogue. It is very important for us to have national dialogue. 
involving all educational stakeholders and policymakers in Africa and in Ghana, so that we can discuss and debate the issues and then see how we can fashion out more innovative interventions and policies to be able to direct and push the implementation of the online learning forward. But for now, as we are thinking of the blended learning, we should see it as the way to go. Ghana, the government of Ghana and Ministry of Education should have a second look at banning students from using smartphones on campuses, especially senior high schools. Because after senior high schools, they need the basic ICT or digital literacy to be able to transition to the universities. Mm -hmm. If they should come to the universities and they cannot open a simple file or they cannot create a simple folder to be able to store their files there, then they are, it's going to be very problematic for us to prepare them for the future. And therefore, I see it as a, an opportunity for us to work. have a second look at that policy, which will allow the student to be using smartphones on campus. However, under the guidance and supervision of what? That two tests. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And then we look forward to engaging you more, to partner with you more, so that we can deliver more teaching and more conferences and more workshops to our colleagues in Africa and in Ghana so that together we can move education to the next level. And then at the end, we should be able to achieve the vision 2030 and then African Union Agenda 2063. I thank you very much and I thank Association of African Universities and then you, my host, Mr. Chrissy Sam, for right. the opportunity to speak with you. Bye. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Ibarham Idrisu. He is a senior tutor at Bagabaga Baga College of Education, and um, she's the, one of the freshest PhDs we have. And so we will be going to him more on issues of education and um, even beyond. Viewers, this is how far time will permit us to bring you AU Talks today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in our next episode. But until then, please stay safe. Make sure that you abide by the COVID protocols. Put on your nose mask. If you have just um, uh, just a person living around you, make sure you put on your nose mask beautifully as Dr. Barry Ham has done. Okay, so see you same yeah. time next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Visit our social media platform, visit our TV website, and learn more about what we do as an association. Bye. Bye-bye.